Good to see all of you joining our Saturday Bible study with a hunger for the word of God. If we don't fill ourselves with the word of God, our spirit man will starve. So that's one thing that we can't afford to do at any given time. Amen. So the title for today's Bible study is The Discipline of Infilling. The Discipline of Infilling. Why don't you say this together with me? The Discipline of Infilling. Say, Lord, I need this discipline of infilling. Without an infilling, we need to understand an outpouring cannot happen. For example, if you take an empty glass, it's, a, it's just an empty glass up until you pour maybe water or any other liquid into that glass and it comes to a level where that glass cannot hold that water anymore and it begins to overflow. This is exactly what happens even with the anointing God has given us. The more we are filled with the presence of God, we can overflow in his presence. Now, overflowing in the presence of God is such a beautiful thing. It's not as messy as, you know, when you uh, fill a jug to the brim and you keep pouring more, what happens? It begins to spill. And if it's on a table, the table mats and everything, the floor, will become wet, so you will have to clean it up. But the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a very beautiful thing. But for the outpouring to take place, first of all, what we need to understand is an infilling needs to happen. An infilling needs to happen. This is why we see in Acts chapter 2, there's an infilling of the Holy Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. When the disciples gathered together in the upper room, the Bible says that there were there was an infilling. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, and the disciples were so disciplined that they continued in the Word and they continued in that discipline in order to maintain that infilling. Now, for each and every one of us, the same principle applies. We have to continue in this discipline of being infilled with the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. So we're going to look at three main aspects to this teaching. Okay, Number one, infilling begins with you. This is the first area. Infilling begins with you. Now, all of us, we need to understand that we can't depend on the spiritual manner that we received 10 years ago. Why I'm saying that is, now, 10 years have gone by, you are in a new season, you are doing something completely different altogether, and therefore you need fresh manna from heaven. How many of you believe that you need fresh manna from heaven in every season? This is why we can't depend on the anointing. No, if you get conformed in your mind, thinking, oh, the Lord did some powerful things three years ago, Praise God. Yes, God is the God of all goodness. He will give you breakthroughs from time to time. And the important thing is, don't limit yourself to what God did back then because what God is about to do now is something greater. It's something much more powerful. And in order for us to see that, in order for us to go to that destination, to see what he's going to do right before our eyes, we have to make sure that this continuous infilling is maintained. So number one, we need to understand that infilling begins with you. This is why it's very important for us to not to neglect our secret place in the Lord. You must not neglect your secret place in the Lord. If we do that, there won't be an infilling. The only way that we can maintain this continuous infilling is by maintaining or not neglecting our secret place in the Lord. Let's uh, read Psalm chapter 91, verse number 1. Psalm chapter 91, verse number 1 is where we're going to start this morning. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will remain secure 
and rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Within brackets, now if you read the Amplified Version, it beautifully illustrates by saying, your secret place in the Lord is also the shelter of the Most High. That's another term given for the secret place. It's the shelter of the Most High for you. And you will remain secure and rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And within brackets, the Bible says, whose power no enemy can withstand. So in order for this continuous infilling to take place, we need to make sure that we always be in our secret place because the secret place is your place of shelter. The secret place is your place of shelter. When I say shelter, it's a place of your spiritual shelter. We have a roof above our head and that is a natural form of shelter. The same way the Lord gives us a spiritual covering when we stay or remain in the secret place where the secret place becomes a shelter to you and I. Another important thing, the secret place is also where you grow. So much of growth happens in your secret place. You know, the Lord was ministering to me this morning with the seed the mustard seed, any seed for that matter, when it's planted, it goes underground. You dig up the soil, you put it inside, you put the seed inside the soil and you cover it by the soil again. And no one sees what's happening inside the soil until a certain season where then suddenly you begin to see growth above the earth. So, the seed grows in secret. The same way, when in your secret place in the Most High, the Lord will plant spiritual seeds in your heart that will begin to grow over time. And a time will come where those seek the seeds that grow in secret in the place of in the secret place of the Almighty, they will be so powerful. So remember the secret place. As much as it's your shelter, it's a place where you grow. This is why we must never neglect our prayer life. How we can continue to uh, be co consistent in this discipline of infilling is by maintaining prayer life. Number two, the second area is don't seek infilling of his word only to meet the purpose. Don't seek filling, don't seek infilling of his word and his presence just to meet the purpose. What I mean that is, for example, don't neglect your prayer life, don't neglect studying the word of God up until a challenge comes your way. And then you take the Bible to your hand and you begin to turn, flip the pages of the Bible. No, the Bible says. Be prepared. Be prepared. You know, I heard uh, very recently, about a week ago, uh, from a pastor friend of mine, uh, another pastor who is known to him has been uh, uh, entertaining or dabbling with an uh, extramarital affair. Okay? So, after a while, you know, you can never do something behind in the darkness. Jesus said, everything a person tries to do in the darkness will be exposed one day in the light. So when that happened, my pastor friend has asked this pastor, um, how, how did you uh, manage you know, during those days? How could you, you know, dabble in this sin and still continue to pray, to preach, to share the word and all that? And you know what this pastor has said? Those days, I only prayed and read the word just to preach. This is what he has said. I didn't spend time in the Lord for myself. Every time I had to preach, half an hour before that, I will start praying, receive a message from the word, deliver it, that's it. It was only to meet the purpose. But if we do the same thing, guaranteed there will be trouble waiting down the line. The enemy will We try to follow that approach. 
the infilling you need to understand is primarily and first and foremost is for you and it begins with you. Before you being infilled, my precious people of God, you can't pour out to someone else. This is exactly, you know, the dangerous things that happen in ministry today. Some people, they become comfortable thinking, oh yes, so the anointing teaches us everything. For example, they will say 1 John chapter 2 verse number 27 says, the anointing will teach me everything, right? So I can wait until 10 minutes before the, uh, the message. Even 10, before, 10 minutes before the message, if I take the Bible to my hand, that will be enough. There are people who think like this. And you know what happens? They Sadly, they be, end up becoming casualties to the enemy. And prominent names in a ministry to the Christian ministry today, they are, they are falling because they are neglecting their secret place. So we need to understand that we can't seek the infilling of his presence and his word just to meet the purpose only. The main and the primary purpose is for our infilling, is for us to grow, is for us to maintain the fire of the Holy Spirit of God. After that comes the outpouring. So don't wait to study the word of God wait until you come across a challenge in life. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 15. We're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 15. A solid instruction given by Paul to Timothy saying, study the word of God. Study. And Paul doesn't say study only when a challenge comes your way. He says study to show yourself as an uh, approved servant unto God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that doesn't need to be put to shame. Rightly dividing the word of truth. This is a very important thing that happens when we maintain the infilling of his presence, the infilling of his spirit, and the infilling of his word into our spirit. He helps us to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. So number one, infilling begins with you and then don't seek infilling of his word only to meet the purpose. The third area, we are going to look at what we can learn from Jesus when it comes to this area. Number three, the third area for today's message is know when you need refilling. Know when you need refilling. How many of you uh, have used, or you know, I mean, um, certain printers also you get ink cartridges that you can refill. No. And there are so many other things that you can refill them. But the dangerous thing is, if you wait until the ink or that the liquid goes to way below minimum, it can destroy that cartridge and you might not be able to even refill again. So it's very important as a child of God to know when to refill. You must know when you need a re-infilling in your spirit. So we're going to look at from the life of Jesus six areas. Six areas that we can learn how Jesus teaches us about when we need re-infilling. I don't say, Pastor B, I thought you said at the beginning only three areas and we are done. By this time, you should know me when I say three areas. The third area, the final area will come with another five or six points. <laughs> Amen. But we are going to look at the life of Jesus. It's very important for us to learn from the life of Jesus. Okay, so we are going to look at how discerning we must be in order for us to know we need a re -influence. Number one. Before starting something important, before starting something major and important, very important, before you start something major, don't just think, don't be content with your spiritual maturity thinking, oh yes, I'm good. No, I can start this thing. I don't think I need to spend time in prayer. The anointing is functioning so powerfully in me. 
No, don't take that approach. Because before Jesus started his public ministry, the Bible tells us that Jesus fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1, and Luke chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus, before he started his public ministry, he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. So let me read Luke chapter 4, verse number 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights. There are certain times that you can pray like this, where that time of prayer, my precious people of God, will take you through that entire, entire time. So, we need to understand. I thank God for the spirit of humor uh, that God has given so, some people here. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, remember my precious people of God. Those 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness would have definitely taken, would have done something so powerful for him to be consistent in those three years. Amen. So, remember. One of the times, moments that you need a refilling is before you start something important in your life. Then, number two, to focus on prayer. You need to also just focus on prayer. You need to corner yourself in the secret place of the Most High just to pray also. Because when you pray, there is an infilling that takes place in your spirit. Because the Bible tells us Jesus isolated himself from his disciples and the crowds from time to time to do what? Not for him to go and uh, you know, party and you know, to, to enjoy. No. Jesus enjoyed. Jesus did all of that when he, when, it, when he had to do it. But his discipline was so good that he knew when he had to focus on prayer. Mark chapter 6 verse 45 and 46. We're going to read Mark chapter 6, verse 45 and verse 46. This is what the Bible tells us. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. Listen to verse number 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Jesus knew when prayer was needed in, in his life. Now, an important question we need to ask ourselves is, do you know when you need to pray? Do you know the time that you are called to pray? That God wants you to isolate yourself, to con yourself in your room and to pray together with him because there are times that you need to just focus on prayer. Amen. Number three. Now this is becoming even more interesting. This is all, everything, you know what uh, Jesus is teaching us. Number three. We need an infilling or a re-infilling in us in order to recharge after hard work. To recharge after hard work. You need to understand for those of us in ministry, if you are busy for example, three to four days continuously doing ministry, you need to take a good break for another three to four days just to refill your spirit by being in the presence of God. That is very important. Let's read Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. However, the report went around concerning Jesus all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear 
and to be healed by him of their infirmity. So now Jesus, his popularity has you know, spread across so many regions and people were bringing a lot of people who were sick, who were demon possessed, who were you know, knocked down by the enemy. So Jesus was preaching, he was sharing from the word of God, he was healing people who were sick, he was delivering uh, the demon possessed. And look at about verse number 16 says, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Why did Jesus do this? My precious people of God, you need to understand preaching, deliverance, healing the sick, all of this will spiritually drain a person. Now, you would have often heard from me that I spend hours and hours in the presence of God in prayer and in the word of God. Why? You know why? Because, for example, on a Wednesday night, just to pray from 8 to 9, I have realized I need that kind of an infilling for at least three hours before. So during those three hours, you know what happens? My wife wouldn't even come and disturb me during that time. Because she has seen and she knows the kind of infilling that I need. When I have to minister on a Saturday at Union Church at the, uh, the worship night, to minister, to deliver the word, for all of us there to experience the power of God, be it just for one hour, I need to spend time before that because we need to understand if we, we can't continue ministering like this day after day, minute after minute, without being recharged. Recharging our spirits is very important. This is why the Bible is telling us that when people were brought to Jesus, he preached, he delivered them, he healed the sick, he cast out demons. And verse number 16, he often withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. When Jesus knew he had to recharge himself after hard work, he told his disciples, okay, just go and do what I've told you to do. He kept himself also away from the uh, multitudes. And Jesus went by himself into the wilderness. And what did he do? The Bible doesn't say that he went into the wilderness and had a party there. No. The Bible emphatically says that he often withdrew into the wilderness and did what? He prayed. He prayed. Because prayer brings that refilling into our lives. When I say into our lives, it's the spirit. Your spirit needs to be recharged to continue doing it because maintaining, maintaining consistency is very important. And in order to maintain consistency, we can't keep doing it every single minute without taking a break to recharge. It's very important, my precious people of God. And for those of you who are slain in the spirit, we are praying that the spirit of the Lord will awaken you also. Amen. <laughs> so number three is to recharge after hard work. Amen. So for those of you precious ones who joined just a few uh, minutes ago, today we are looking at the discipline of infilling. Okay, The discipline of infilling. We need to be refilled and in, with an infilling of the Holy Spirit of God and with the power of God, with the word of God from time to time. Amen. So the third area is to recharge after hard work. Here is another very important area. Number four, to work through grief. To work through what? Through grief. It's a very important or a very crucial moment each of us will have to go through in our lives. And Jesus teaches us how to do this beautifully because when you are going through a moment of grief in your life, that's the time where your emotions will be troubled to a certain extent. Now, how many of you agree with me with what I'm saying? No? That's why we all go through moments of grief. Please don't tell me when, some, um, when someone who is very close to you in your life I'm pretty sure all of you have, you know, had very close people to you have gone to be with the Lord. And don't tell me, you, you know, you put your legs up and you said, oh, you started laughing and said, ah, oh, that person has gone to be with the Lord. No, no. And you started laughing right throughout the day. No. 
there's a certain amount of sadness that took over because that person was very close to you. And in these kind of moments of grief, we need to understand, we need to go before the presence of the Lord to receive another re -inflame. It's very important that we do this. I can remember last Saturday, I had to minister at a union church. Again, last Saturday was the day of my father's uh, birthday. And four months before, he had gone to be with the Lord. because, And his birthday was quite emotional to me. So I spent hours in the presence of the Lord. And I said, Lord, I need your presence. Now, let's look at how Jesus also teaches us. Because we can see in the Bible, Jesus also went through a time of grief. And he also went after the presence of God to be refilled. Matthew chapter 14, we are going to read verses 10 to 14. Matthew chapter 10, oh, sorry, Matthew chapter 14, verses 10 to 14. Matthew chapter 14, this is after Jesus loses his very own cousin. So he sent, now this is Herod, okay? So Herod sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. We all know this story. On his birthday, Herod had a me me mega party, you know, because he was probably would have been a bit too drunk. He, he looked at um, that little uh, girl, I think uh, Herod is a daughter, and said, anything you want, let me know. I will give it to you, because the Bible says she danced and she pleased. And she goes to the mother, and the mother in her craftiness says, ask for the head of John the, the Baptist. So what happens? Now King Herod has given an oath which he couldn't reverse. So he got John to be killed. He beheaded, got his soldiers to behead John. And then what happens? That news comes to Jesus, where Jesus gets to know that his own cousin has been beheaded. Verse number 12. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now let's look at what Jesus does. Okay, verse number 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Look at what Jesus does. Jesus has heard at such a terrible, shocking and a, a Grieving news. Why? Because this is his own flesh and blood in other terms. His own cousin. The guy who baptized Jesus in John. He looked at Jesus and said, are you coming to me to get baptized? I need to be baptized from you. And Jesus said, no, for the fulfillment of the word, you do this for now. And this very person, his own cousin, has been beheaded. My goodness. Just imagine. I don't think anyone here, you know, we've all have probably have, would have had their loved ones who have gone to be with the Lord, probably because of a natural death or a sickness. But is there a single person here who's one of your loved ones have been beheaded? Just imagine. Hearing someone has gone to be with the Lord and hearing that someone has been beheaded who is known to you, who is in your family, my goodness, what kind of grief will that bring? You will be in so much agony. And the Bible says the moment that news came to Jesus, he also left everyone. The Bible says he got into a boat, he deserted, he went to a deserted place to be by himself. Now here is the important thing. What is the point that we are looking at today, right now? is to work through grief. When you are going through a moment of grief, you go to the Lord to be re to receive that rain filling and you get supercharged. You know what happens? When you continue reading, Jesus comes down. Thereafter, what happens? He feeds the 5,000. Can you see what happens? In that moment of grief, he goes seeking the presence of God for that rain fillment. He receives it. He comes back. An amazing miracle takes place. He feeds 
the 5,000. So another crucial place that we need to be after the presence of God is when we are going through moments of grief. Because all of us, somewhere down the line, we have gone through these moments, we will continue to go through these moments, and we need to remember when we go through moments of grieving, we need to be after the presence of God. Amen. The last two points. Number five. Before making important decisions, before making important decisions, it's very important to see the presence of God. Don't just make important decisions by jumping into them. Don't make decisions in your life haphazardly. Go before the presence of the Lord, pray and say, Lord, please show me what has to be done. Because the Bible tells us, that even before Jesus chose his 12 disciples, he did a very important thing. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. The Bible tells us, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So Jesus goes out to pray and he continues in prayer all night. Verse number 13. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself and from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. Can you see? Jesus didn't do anything haphazardly. If he wanted to, no, he was the son of God. He could have easily called these 12 to him and said, ah, no. But in order for us to benefit, for us to learn about discipline, about being after the presence of God, Jesus, he prays right throughout the night. And the next day, he selects his 12 disciples. So, my precious people of God, before you make important decisions in your life, don't jump into those decisions haphazardly. The right kind of approach you need to have at any given time is to be after the presence of God, hear from the Holy Spirit of God, and then make those decisions. Last but not least, in times of distress, in times of distress, in times of great distress and times where you are greatly troubled, it's important that you go to the presence of God. It's important that you keep seeking the presence of God and you need to keep, you need to be after God in prayer. Prayer is very powerful, very especially in times of distress. This is why we see Jesus knowing what he was about to face, that is his death, we can see how he again Praise. Let's read our last couple of verses for today. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 44. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 44. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Let's read verse number 41. Listen to this. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, look at this. Jesus was in agony. He was in agony and he prayed more earnestly. One of the greatest disciplines that we need to have, my precious people of God, is when we are in agony, when we are going through distress, we must learn how to pray more earnestly. Then the Bible says, even his sweat become like great drops of blood falling down from the ground. He was in agony, but he prayed even more earnestly. We need to be disciplined in this area. 
where when we go through moments of distress in our lives, that we will keep pressing into prayer more and more and more. Hallelujah. So how many of you are saying that this message from the Lord has blessed you this morning? Because we all need this re-infilling. You know, we all need, very especially, you know, before you start something important, before you start something major, just for you to focus on prayer, very important, to recharge after hard work, to work through grief. Remember, just like Jesus did, before making important decisions and also in times of distress. When we are in agony, press into the presence of God with prayer and he will fill you again. And when the presence of the Holy Spirit gets sparked in you again, oh boy, nothing can come against that strength. When the Holy Spirit gives you his strength, when, he, when you start sensing his presence in you powerfully, nothing of the enemy can come against you. So I bless you with this teaching this morning and I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will help us to keep maintaining this discipline in us every single day. Amen. God bless you.